Ugly, a memoir by Robert Hogue. Chapter 13, Games Not Played. One afternoon, I returned from school extremely excited. Mom, Mom, I've got something to show you, I yelled. Can I, Mommy, can I? How about you tell me what it is you want? I rummaged in my school bag, pushing aside books and pencils and half-squished bananas I hadn't gotten around to eating, and pulled out a sheet of paper. It was a permission slip for parents to sign, allowing their boys to play school sports. Can I, can I, can I play? Stop, Mom said. I'm trying to read this properly. She read it once, then turned it over, but there was nothing on the back. She read it again, taking it slow, then a third time. Well, I'd like to have a think about it and talk to Dad, she said. Is that okay? Everyone else in the family was involved in sports in one way or another. Even Mom, who didn't really play anything much, had started managing the tennis team Catherine played on. The sport I wanted to play was called Rugby League. Rugby League is a lot like American football, but with no helmets and no pads, and fewer cheerleaders. Two teams of 13 players lined up against each other on a grassy, rectangular field. Each team tries to carry the ball downfield and score a try, like a touchdown. Teams had six tackles or downs to score before the opposing team took possession of the ball and tried to score. It was a simple game, and where I lived, it was the most popular sport to play and watch. Even for young kids, though, it was a tough contact sport. You ran at a bunch of kids standing in front of you trying to block your way and either somehow managed to break through, or a bunch of them would fall on you when you didn't. It was a mess of arms and legs going all over the place. One way or another, you'd come into violent contact with some other kid. Mom and Dad were under instructions from my doctors to avoid knocks to my head. Surgeons didn't want a forearm or a foot undoing all their good work. Neither did my parents. Just as bad was the chance another player could cop a whack from one of my artificial legs. Both were much harder than a real leg and could cause some serious harm. There was no way Mom and Dad could let me play. Mom went to school to see Mr. French, who was in charge of organizing the teams for our school. She explained to him the reasons I couldn't play and asked if there was some way I could be involved on the sidelines. They came up with a plan for me to be a ball boy on the side of the field, kicking the ball back in when it came out of bounds and helping players set up the ball for place kicks. Do you mind if you only play on the sidelines, Robert? Mom asked when she arrived home. I don't mind what I do or where I am as long as I'm playing and as long as I'm there. She and Dad both made a show of signing the permission slip but I'm not really sure it ever made its way to school. We won that first game. I even got to go on the field a few times. It felt good, but deep down I knew I wasn't part of the team. A year later, I came home from school one day and called to Mom from my bedroom while I was getting changed, asking her if I could play Saturday morning rugby league. No reply. I guess she hadn't heard me. Later, I went to my school bag and retrieved the slip of paper with all the information on it. I put it on the table in front of her. Give me a straight answer, yes or no, I said. Would you be very disappointed if I said no? Mom asked. I started to cry. Once again, Mom explained that it was a tough contact sport. I was likely to be hurt if an elbow or a foot hit me in the face, and other players were likely to be hurt if a clump of metal from one of my legs hit their head. I just kept crying. We watched rugby league every Sunday night on televisions. Sometimes I even got to go with Dad and watch games at the stadium. The players were some of my biggest heroes. Maybe you could play tennis, Mom suggested. I don't want to play tennis, I shouted at her. Mom almost lost her temper then, but she took a long breath, then closed her eyes for a moment before responding. I'll talk to Dad about it when he gets home from work. I stormed off, sulking. Next morning, I grabbed the sheet of paper and excitedly plonked it in front of Dad at the breakfast table. Can I play, Dad? No, Robert, you can't play, he said. I started crying again. Why not? It's too dangerous, Mom said. If you play a sport like that, you'll just end up hurting yourself or someone else. I crossed my arms like I'd seen people do on television when they were cranky but determined. Dad tried to cheer me up. These kids kick each other in the shins and then they put their fingers up each other's nose when no one is looking, he said. I didn't laugh. Are you sure you don't want to play tennis, Mom asked. Yes. Well, go have your bath and get ready for school then, she said. I'm not going to school, I said.
Mom shrugged. Suit yourself. Dad glowered at me and pointed toward the bathroom, and I went. When I came home from school, Mom again talked to me about tennis. I still wasn't very keen, but after a while, Mom sent me into her bedroom to retrieve a package all wrapped up that she'd left on the bed. It's a tennis racket! It was just like the one Catherine had. I was excited to have my own tennis racket at first, but I didn't really pursue the sport or make the most of training Mom and Dad offered. I wanted to be part of a team, win, lose, or draw, but mostly win. We'd go around in circles every few months. I'd argue that I should be allowed to play some sport, and my parents would say no. Summer was cricket season, but that would involve having a hard, heavy ball aimed at my body at significant speed. It was another no. I loved swimming, too, but it wasn't the kind of team sport I wanted to play, and I wasn't fast enough to be competitive. Running was the same as swimming, with the added benefit that I fell over all the time. One by one, all the sports were eliminated. In elementary school, the closest I got to any organized competition was Friday afternoon sports. Most of the other kids would go off to play competitions against nearby schools, but there'd be a bunch of us left behind the injured, the uncommitted, the uncoordinated, the ones who couldn't catch, the crippled. I would have happily spent my time in the library. Alas, this gaggle of uncoordinated misfits was rounded up each week and made to play some sort of sport against each other. We'd get into our sports gear and head down to one of the ovals not being used for a real sport. We'd be told what sport we were going to play for the afternoon. Often it was softball, but sometimes it was a made-up sport designed to at least keep us active for the last hour and a bit of school week. The teacher would choose two captains. The captains would then look the rest of us over, using their obvious years of sporting experience, training, coaching, and performing at the highest levels of athletic competition, and they'd slowly put us poor suckers out of our misery. It would start like this. Whichever captain had first pick would select the super competitive skinny kid who didn't play an organized sport because his parents were worried he'd break something. It was rare but not unknown to have some kids with actual athletic talent with us there on those Friday afternoons. Then the captains would make their way through the kids who had some skills but weren't as well rounded. The kid who could catch but couldn't bat. The kid who could bat but couldn't run. The first few times I waited with excitement for my name to be called. I couldn't run fast, but the teacher always allowed someone else to run for me if we were playing something like softball. I figured my chances of getting picked were as good as those of anyone else. My hopes were soon dashed, though. It became very obvious very quickly that even on a team of nobodies with no sporting talent and often even less enthusiasm, no one was keen to pick me. The captains would keep going until there were only three or four students left. This is where things would get really interesting. The two captains would look over and see that it was a choice between the crippled kid, the kid who could not catch a ball even if it was dropped gently into his cupped hands from inches above, the kid who had a cast taken off their broken ankle only last week, and the kid who just couldn't get the rules of any game no matter how often you tried to explain them. The captains would be down to their second to last choice. They'd look us over, look at each other, sometimes look at the teacher, and invariably they'd call out Robert. I'd hear my name and I'd limp on over to my teammates, occasionally issuing a high five and talking about how we were going to crush our opponents. But in my heart, I'd known there was no honor in being chose second to last. Every now and then I'd get my hopes up, thinking maybe I'd be recognized for my brilliant tactical or motivational skills and would be chosen first for a change. Other times I would have been happier to be picked last. It would have been honest at least. But no, second to last had become the new last. When you're a young boy who loves sports, there's hardly anything worse than being picked second to last for a sporting team, knowing the captain probably would have picked you last, but didn't because he either felt sorry for you or was worried he'd get a disapproving look from the teacher. It seemed like there was no sport for me to play. People sometimes assumed I had been playing a sport when I was injured, which seemed unfair, even cruel, when I wanted to play so badly and wasn't able to. When I was 12, I once went into an elevator by myself. Two middle-aged ladies got in after me. One of them looked me up and down and then stared at my face long enough to make me look away. Terrible how they let kids so young play rough sports these days, she said to her friend. Look at the damage it does. The other woman turned and stared at me too. Yes, yes, it is, she said. 
Some of the best talks I have ever had started with someone asking, This might seem rude, but can I ask about your face, nose, scars, bumps? Wherever those conversations ended up, they started as honest exchanges. Acknowledging someone's differences can be about saying, You're not scared to talk to someone about the things that make them who they are. Those few moments in the elevator were not one of those times, and I stayed silent until we reached the ground floor. I should have cringed or felt embarrassed or angry at those two women, but at the time, I just wanted to laugh. Lady, if only you knew how much I wished I was this ugly because I was allowed to play sports. Chapter 14, Things Written Down. Things in class were almost as dire as they were on the sporting field. I made it to grade three, where I had my first male teacher, Mr. French. He was tall with a booming voice and a bushy beard. The nuns I'd had in grades one and two were mysterious, unknowable, but Mr. French was a civilian. We spent long days tackling spelling and multiplication and grammar, but we seemed to spend most of our time on handwriting. We were expected to master running writing, or cursive. My attempts were so shaky, so misshapen, so ugly, it looked like I'd interpreted running riding to mean riding done while running in a race. Not good enough, Robert. You've got to try harder, Mr. French said again and again. Don't hurry so much. Slow down and think about what you're doing with your pen. Finally, it was time for a test. Not a spelling test or a vocabulary test, a handwriting test. Mr. French would read out a sentence and we had to write it down as neatly as we could. I slowed down and did okay for the first three or four letters but I quickly fell behind as Mr. French read the next sentence and I had to rush to catch up. This meant messy letters again. After a few painful sentences, we finished. My paper might as well have been covered in the etchings of an alien language, written left-handed while standing on my head, in a pool. My test came back with a single check mark on the entire page and lots of very precise, neat X marks. One out of 10. Mr. French called me and two other kids to the front of the class. He told us there was no reason for handwriting that messy, and we clearly hadn't been practicing. I started going red. It was the first time I'd been called out in front of the class for bad schoolwork. Then he said four words that scarred me for life. Hold out your hands. Schools at that time still punish students by whacking their hands or bottoms with straps or a long, thin piece of wood called a cane. We were going to get the cane. I'd been in trouble at school before, but most of the time that just meant a whack on the bottom from one of the nuns. After I heard the initial whack, I wish I'd been in first in line. I closed my hands and started to slowly curl my fingers. Flat hand, Robert, Mr. French said as he approached me. He brought the cane down on my hand, and I thought it was going to split in two. It left a cranky red mark across my hand, my writing hand. I closed my eyes again and tried not to cry. Right then and there, I decided that what my words meant and said were more important than how they looked. I decided I'd always choose writing faster over writing neat. I'd sacrifice legibility on the altar of speed. Looks didn't matter so much. Grade four was worlds better. I had one of the best teachers of all my school years, Gary Bolton. He was young and energetic. He played the guitar and taught us how to make tacos. He showed us batik, letting us paint wax patterns on cloth and t-shirts and spill dye everywhere. He read us passages from the Lord of the Rings in which the two tiny hobbits, Frodo and Sam, are taken by the evil Gollum into their lair of the giant spider Shalab. Gollum leads them there as a ruse so Shalab can sting them and he can regain the ring. I'd be one of those kids clamoring for more, more, please, sir, when Mr. Bolton would eventually sigh and say it was enough for that day. I told him how exciting it was to be hearing a story from such a big book. You know what, Robert, he said? Maybe you could write one of your own someday. I'd never really thought about that before. Life outside of the classroom was changing for me, too. I was getting better at dealing with the other kids. If someone started teasing me, I did my best to ignore it. I was also starting to understand that I could try to ignore or shake off the way I felt when people called me names. At home, I was learning how to deal with my four older siblings, learning how to argue, even while losing 82% of the arguments I had with them, and almost all the arguments I had got into with my parents. 
I was starting to understand what was easy and comfortable and what was more challenging. I was starting to conquer my disability and grasp my place in the small world I inhabited. Then I met my first true love. Her name was Michelle. She was new to the school. Michelle and her older sister were just starting at Guardian Angels that year. She had deep brown eyes and hair three shades from red. She was in Mr. Bolton's class with me, enjoying math and English and batik and eating tacos along with everyone else. She seemed distant, but in a warm way that felt like she just really hadn't got to know many people yet. I decided she simply had to be my girlfriend. I didn't know much about girls, but I knew I couldn't just go up to her and say something. I wondered for a little while about the best way to communicate my deep felt passion and decided to commit it to paper. I grabbed a pencil and ripped a sheet from my exercise book. The page came out with a ragged tear and the pencil turned out to be a green one, but that would have to do. In my head, I, what I wrote read like the most exquisite poem ever committed to paper by a 10 year old. It was smart and beautiful, poetry from a midget Shakespeare. Mr. Bolton had said maybe I could write a book someday, so surely this would be easy. The next challenge was to deliver the poem to Michelle. I thought about leaving it for her in class, but I had the sense that it might end up getting me in trouble. My best bet would be to deliver the note at lunchtime. Find Michelle, give her the note, and wait for endless love. Easy. The problem was that the girls and boys played in different parts of the playground. There was the occasional border skirmish, but crossing from one side to the other were rare. I stood near the border of the girls' area, waiting, trying to spot Michelle. Robert F. came and joined me and asked what I was doing. I'm looking for Michelle, I said, to give a message to her. Can't see her, Robert F. said. Nope. A few other boys came to join us, and when I explained what I was doing, one of them shouted, Hey, girls, come here for a second, would you? Hey, girls. It was loud enough to attract the attention of two girls wandered over. Robert wants to get this message to Michelle. Can you find her and give it to her? One of the girls nodded. She held out her hand, and I gave her the note containing what felt like the two most important sentences I'd ever write. The girl then moved a few steps away and said, We'll give it to Michelle, but we need to read it first. No! I yelled horrified. The girl smiled and slowly unfolded the note. You want Michelle to be your girlfriend? She said. You? The other girl laughed too, and a couple of boys behind me sniggered. Then came the reminders. You've got a funny nose, one of the girls said. And no legs, one of the boys behind me said. Give it back, I said. No, we'll make sure we get it to Michelle. The school bell clock called us back to class, and the girl turned and ran. I tried to chase her, but she was faster than me. The note was either on its way to Michelle or to someone else entirely. I didn't have any idea what to do, but I had to get back to class. I spent the rest of the day worried that the message had been delivered to Michelle, and equally worried that it hadn't. I didn't look at her once the whole afternoon. After endless nervous hours, school was over for the day. I was packed up, school bag over my shoulder, and ready to go faster than anyone, or so I thought. Michelle was faster. Before I could move, she was there, standing in front of my desk. Hi, Robert, she said, and smiled. Hi, Michelle, I said. Now would be a good time to magically grow legs so I could run away, I thought. I got your note, she said. Oh. I could tell by the look in her eyes that it was not going to be good news. Michelle declined my offer of boyfriendship. It's just, you're a boy, she said. I shrugged and escaped as fast as I could without saying a word. My love letter had only two sentences, and later I figured out I had spelled her name wrong. I didn't even think to sign my name to it. Not my most successful piece of writing ever. I'd done it in a hurry, too, so it wasn't even neat. Mr. French would not have been impressed. The teasing subsided a few days later. Not once did I think Michelle had said no for any reason other than I was a boy. My time at Guardian Angels was coming to an end. Boys left the school after grade four and usually headed for Iona, where they'd do both middle and high school. You know what, Robert? My brother Michael said when we were talking about it at home one day. What? You know what they do at Iona if you spit on the ground? What? I asked, starting to worry. If you spit on the ground there, one of the seniors makes you get down on your hands and knees and lick it up. Michael started licking the air like it tasted nice. Do they really? I asked. Yep, Gary said. I saw it happen just the other day. Grade 5 kid had to lick up his spit from the quadrangle 
Those seniors, they'll push your face right into the ground to make sure you lick that spit up. Michael and Gary took great delight in seeing how much this terrified me. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Any school that would make someone lick up their own spit, lick it up off the actual ground, must be really tough. The funny thing was, I was not the kind of kid who ever in a thousand years would even think about spitting on the ground. I knew Dad would be most displeased if I ever did something so crude. I don't know why I was so worried. Off to Iona I went, half expecting to see kids on all fours licking up spit. I'd survived my first four years of school, hadn't scared the girls too much, and was about to make my way into the big school down the road. Surely it couldn't be that bad, I thought. And it wasn't. It was worse.